By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I have a top 10 for you, a Timmy's top 10, a top 10 old school creatures. And I came to this idea when I visited a website called The Wizard's Tower, and it's an old blog. It look, looks like it hasn't been updated in 2019, but there are a lot of useful uh, blog posts on there and very entertaining to read as well. And I'll have a link to that website in the description below. So that's the wizardstower.wordpress.com. And one of the blog posts that I saw was written by Jared Duchette. And I've actually played Jared Duchette. I don't know if, if he remembers, but uh, I think, I believe he kicked my ass and it was in the uh, Summer Derby. A really nice guy. Um, and he's made a top 10 list of old school creatures. And when I was going through his list and reading his blog post, I kind of got this idea of, you know what, I'm gonna make my own list and I'm gonna ask you guys uh, for feedback. Like, what do you think of this list? Uh, do you agree? So, I mean, the choices are purely made on my own opinion. So it's it's just my own opinion. So you can agree, you can disagree. I'm curious to hear about your choices, like what choices would you have made different? So here it is, my top 10. And on number 10, I have Suchi. So this artifact creature is 4444. And when it goes to the graveyard, it's control against four colorless mana. Now, obviously when you're playing this in Eternal Central, or Atlantic or any other format where uh, you play with mana burn, this creature is not as strong, but still it is strong because it's four colorless mana for a 4-4, which is pretty good stats in old school. It's colorless, meaning you can just put it in every deck and it's combo friendly. And what I mean by that is because it gives you four mana, there are a lot of fun things that you can do with it. Um, think of Transmute Artifact, think of Sage of Latinam, think of Atok and Fireball. There are a lot of combinations here that you can make. And personally, I think, you know, this card can be used more frequently in, in combo style decks. Number nine, I have the Urnum Jinn. Now the Urnum Jinn is one green and three. It's from the Arabian Nights. It's a four five creature. And that says during your upkeep, you must choose one of the opponent's non wall creatures in play. Until your next upkeep, that creature gains the forced walk ability. If opponent has no creatures, ignore this effect. Now, I, I believe that at first people kind of overestimated uh, this little downside, thinking, okay, I'm giving my opponent's creature force walk, meaning uh, he's unblockable, he can, he can get through. Now, what we know by the modern old school game is that it's not really such a drawback. It doesn't really matter. And in a lot of decks, this creature get cast. Um, in, in a lot of decks that don't even play forests, they play the, um, the mocks, the green mocks, or... Uh, they play the City of Brass, so it doesn't even matter. And even if you have a force, so what? You take some extra damage. The strength of this card, in my opinion, is the fact it's just one green, so you can splash it in a lot of different decks. It's only four mana, and it has five toughness. So being five toughness, meaning that it's really hard to kill. If you have that Suchi on the board, you're not going to kill it. You need to double block it somehow. Uh, Sarah Angel's not going to kill it. A lot of staple creatures in old school magic have four power instead of five power meaning they cannot kill this urnum gin really the urnum gin is quite powerful and my third reason that it's in this list it's a staple in a lot of top tier decks and of course uh, urnum Ganon or urnum on ice or whatever um whatever name you want to give it um is one of the top decks that has i believe four of these uh in the deck now obviously a lot of decks now play with City in a Bottle, and that's making it a little bit more vulnerable here in the uh, in the modern old school meta. Okay, let's go to number eight. In number eight, I have Set Troll. Now, Set Troll is one red and two, and it gains plus one plus one if controller has any swamps in play. And for one black, you can regenerate it. Now, um, what I've said here is it's a three three for three basically because when you play it, you play it in a deck with Batlands. So you kind of get that Kurt Abe effect when you play a Tiger, it's a two, three, four, one. In this case, when you play with Batlands, you already have that three, three. Very important stat here is regeneration. I know, of course, you can still use Swords to Plowsiers, but hey, then you're using a Swords to Plowsiers on a three, three creature, which is not too bad, actually, if your opponent is using his Swords on that. And this deck, this card is a staple in one of the top tier decks, Troll Disco. Troll Disco is this deck that works with uh, Larry Nevin's disc, you explode it, hey, I'm gonna regenerate my troll and it's still there. 
Great creature, um, and I've had quite some trouble playing against decks with uh, such trolls. Number seven, we have the Savannah Lion, and the Savannah Lion is, I believe, the only vanilla creature in this list. It's uh, one white, and what I've said here is it's two power for one, so I'm just paying one mana and I'm getting two power back, which is still extremely powerful in, in old school, and it's an aggro classic, so you see it in every aggressive uh, deck that features white. Uh, it's also playable in a tempo deck, and uh, again, it's one of those creatures that you keep see coming back on the top lists if you think of the alban lauter decks and, and there are many other decks where you just keep seeing those savannah lines it's so easy to do multiple things in turn and play a savannah lines because it's only one white and it's also easy if you draw it late game you can do that you can combine multiple spells and play a savannah lines if you um, draw it early game boom it's that instant aggression and your opponent has to do something so it's here on number seven now let's continue to number six and on number six, we have Juzim Jin. And this, of course, is a classic. It's two black and two, and it's a 5-5. Five five, and it says, Juzim Jin does one damage to you during your upkeep. Now, I kind of feel that the people that were making this were kind of having in mind at the time, okay, probably the opponent will have a big wall, so the five power will not break through, like a wall of ice or something. And then you have this drawback of, you know, losing a life a turn. But in reality, this one life a turn is not a problem. In reality, nobody plays with walls. And even if they do, your opponent always has some kind of removal to get rid of walls or any creatures that might threaten the Juzam Jin. It's a 5-5 five, five for 4. Come on, 5-5 five, five for 4. I think the only weird thing about it is that it's not higher in this list. And that reason is actually because in the end, it's still just a 5-5 five, five creature. So uh, And it's black. So there are a lot of ways to... Uh, get rid of it and it's it's double black maybe if it would have been one black and and um, three colorless now i think it's really good it's not but then it would probably be on number one in this list because you could splash it in any deck and obviously it's a staple in any mono black deck or deck that plays heavily heavily um invests in black i think this card would see more play and i think jared also said that in his blog post if it would be a little bit cheaper it's so extremely expensive okay but um let's continue to number five and here on number five and maybe this is a surprise to some of you but here we see the triskelion and the uh maybe you think hey man that's so high because you pay six mana and you essentially get a one one but a one one with three plus one plus one counters on it me <clears throat> sorry making it a four four creature and it says controller uh, Triskelion gets three plus one plus one counters when cast. Controller may discard a plus one plus one counter at any time to do one damage to any target. And this is the the main thing that makes this card so strong is its versatility. It's so versatile. It you play it if there are no threats that you need to take care of, leave it on the board and it's a four four body. But trust me, and I'm, I've been playing with this card for a couple of years. I'm playing with a full play set. Your opponent will always have a little 1-1 one -one creature. And it's so nice to play this. Or a Birds. Or, you know, you name it. Or that Savannah line that we talked about earlier. You play this Triskelion. You go ping, ping, ping. And it's a 2-for-1. It's a 3-for-1. It's great. Also, you can use this just as direct damage. I know it may sound silly, but when you're at the end of a game... And your opponent is, I don't know, on three lives, life completely built in. This is, it's a lightning bolt. I know it's an it's expensive lightning bolt, but it will get you there. And also in combat situations, it can just deal that extra one damage. We looked at the um, Urnim Jin earlier with the five toughness, which is so annoying to get that last point of damage in. With the Triskelion, you can. And my third reason here for putting it on number five, so it's really high up on the list, I realize that, but I have my reasons, is it's, a, in my opinion, a combo masterpiece. One of the unique things about this creature is that it can kill itself. And maybe you're listening to this thinking, why is it good if a creature can kill itself? Well, that's because somebody plays a control magic, boom, it kills itself, goes to your graveyard, and you can get it back. More importantly, somebody plays that Swords to Plowsiers, almost everybody... I mean, one in every two games, uh, decks that you see in old school plays with Swords to Plowsiers. I mean, come on. You see it all the time. And they Swords a creature and it's gone. Not with Triskelion. In response, you, it can ping itself. So, so it deals two damage to your opponent. It kills itself. And your opponent loses a Swords to Plowsiers. 
think about that. And then your Triskelion is in your graveyard and you can play and animate that or, or whatever. You can use or give you an archaeologist. I don't care, but you can do that. You can use good old reconstruction from antiquities. You can use that. You can do that with Triskelion. It's really cool. And I've seen some insane plays. Um, if, if players, um, there are players out there that have created decks around the Triskelion playing with copy artifacts. So then for one blue and one colorless, you have another Triskelion on the board. And then if you also combine it with anime debts, I mean, it's just one big Triskelion party. And before you know it, you'll have four or five Triskelions on the board. And even if you cannot attack with that, let's say your opponent has a moat or your opponent has some kind of other trick. Even then, when you have four or five Triskelions, that's 12 up to 15 direct damage that you have on the board. And that's again that versatility that I, that I talked about at the start when discussing this creature. I mean, it's not a one-dimensional creature. If you look at Juzam Jin, which is fantastic, it's a four mana, five, five, it's the art, wow. But it's not as versatile as the Triskelion. Okay, let's, um, I'm, I'm sure there are people listening to this and completely disagree and thinking I'm bonkers. Let me know, leave a comment, tell, tell me why. Uh, don't be shy. And let's go to number four. On number four, we have a classic, and maybe it's a little bit emotional that I've put it this high on the list, but it's a Sarah Angel. Uh, two white, three colors, it's flying, and it says does not tap when attacking. So that's basically the old school vigilance. And together with Yoshin Soldier, I believe these are the only two creatures that have vigilance. Yoshin Soldier, another creature that I'd like to play more, but it never makes the cut. But okay, well, let's get back to Sarah Angel. So Sarah Angel, the first thing that comes to mind is it's a balanced creature. It's just, it's five mana, it's a four, four flyer. Because of Vigilance, you can use it for offense and defense, which makes it extremely annoying to play against. Because you kind of feel like, come on, and you're dealing damage and you get to block with it. There's like no downside. There's no downside. Another reason why it's this high up the list is because I see it a lot when I'm playing in tournaments. A lot of different decks are playing with this card. Um, you can use it in control decks, you can use it in mid-range decks, you can even use it as kind of a finisher in more aggressive decks. For instance, the White Weenie deck usually plays one or two Sarah Angels. And um, white is a very popular color because of the four swords and the four disenchant, and then it's always a very... Um, obvious choice to kind of add at least one or two Sarah Angels to your list. So that's why it's here on number four. And then we're about to enter the top three. So probably there are a lot of creatures that you've seen in the top 10 that you're like, why are they not in the top three? Why are they not on one? Well, I'm now going to show you the choices that I've made and I'm going to explain why, but maybe it's interesting now. What do you think is, is going to be on the number one list? So maybe you can leave a comment. Think about it. So what do you think is my number one? And I'm pretty sure it's going to surprise you. Okay, let's uh, let's start. Let's look at number three. So on number three, I have Hypnotic Spectre. Maybe you're thinking it's so high up, it's just a 2-2 flyer. It's for three 2-2 flyer. What I think about this card, why I think it's so amazing is this good old school combination of Dark Ritual, Hypnotic Spectre. So that's a turn one play. And I've played against a lot of mono black decks and this has happened to me a lot. And the problem is when you don't have an answer to the turn one Hypnotic Spectre, you have an instant problem. And when you do have an answer, you have the advantage. And that's kind of the weird, weird thing with this card. So kind of let me elaborate on that. So imagine your opponent is playing Dark Ritual into Hypnotic Spectre. That means that he's invested a Dark Ritual into the Hypnotic Spectre, so he's down an extra card. But he's assuming that in turn two he can attack you and he can take a card from your hand and then it's even and after that he can kind of start uh, working on that card advantage. So in essence it's great. What, if, if I would have Dark Ritual and Hippie in, in my turn one opening, I would definitely play it. But hear me out here, when you're the opponent and you have a Lightning Bolt and you can respond by playing a Lightning Bolt, it means it's a two for one. If you have a Swords, it's a two for one. If you have a Maze of If, not as good because you're missing a land drop, but hey, essentially also, it's kind of this, this two for one. It's a weird situation because you are missing that, that extra land drop because you have to play the Maze of If as your land. Um, but the reason that I've put it so high up is that card advantage is such a big deal. And I've seen the Hypnotic Spectre really wreck opponents and really win games for them. Like quick Hypnotic Spectre, and if your opponent has no answer, 
or the people the person that casts this is able to protect the hippie it, it can get ugly really fast so that's why i've said you know this is an instant problem that you have to deal with this is like putting pressure on the board and and really still to this day i think hypnotic specter is one of the best creatures okay so let's go to number two number two i have the surrender of freed and maybe many of you would have thought this would be on the number one spot so the surrender of freed is a 3-4 flyer for just 3 mana, 1 blue and 2, making it extremely splashable. You see it in a, a wide variety of decks, and this is something that uh, Jared Duchette also um, wrote about. It was actually number 1 in his top 10 list. You see it in aggro, mid-range and control decks, because, I mean, a 3-4 flyer for 3 mana, that's just ridiculous statistics. And yes, it deals 1 measly point of damage. Like I said with the Juzam, that's not really a problem. I mean, I, I, I just feel people overestimated that kind of, uh, that downside. I mean, you're not going to find a Wall of Arrow, Wall of Swords. Nobody plays with those cards. So it's um, it's great. Surrender per Freed and, of course, the Four Toughness, meaning you cannot bolt it. So it's just one of those one of these creatures that, yeah, you just see it in so many decks because it's it's just one blue and two. It's, it's great. Let's go to my number one pick. So I wonder if... Anybody who was um, who's posted their number one pick, if if you had this one, it's Mishra's Factory, and you're probably thinking he is such a cheater because that's not even a creature. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. It is a land, of course, technically speaking, but you can turn it into a creature, and I think it's one of the best creatures. Well, the best creature in old school Magic. Um, again, this word that I've used before, it's versatile. Um, you can use it in every single deck, and you see it in almost every single deck, in almost every single tactic. Uh, it's the only creature, one of the only creatures, not the only one, but one of the only creatures that can give itself plus one, plus one, so it can pump itself. Also, if it has any other creatures that are assembly workers, it can give each other plus one, plus one. Another thing that you can do with it is, and that's why there's a lot of synergy here with this card, is you can use a copy artifact and you can copy your own uh, Mishra's Factory when it's turned into an assembly worker. What you can do as well, obviously, is play cards like Wrath of God and after that attack with your assembly worker or, or the Larry Nevin's disc. Activate it and after the, hey, my lands are not destroyed and now I have a creature in play and I can attack. Now, I know there are a lot of discussions of people saying, you know, shouldn't we restrict this card or maybe even ban the card or change the ruling on the card so that it cannot pump itself. Um, I think personally that one of the biggest downsides and maybe that's why it shouldn't be on number one. Again, let me know in the comments below what you think. One of the main downsides of this card is that when you turn it into a creature, it is an artifact, it is a land, and it is a creature. So that means that you have hundred different ways to get rid of this mistress factory and trust me in a lot of you know i play a lot of decks with disenchants because i just love my disenchants instant speed um and sometimes i'm happy when my opponent is casting that mistress factory turn one because i know that he's probably going to attack with it turn two and then i have my disenchant ready or my sword supplies here is ready or I have a strip mine. Well, strip mine is more obvious, but I have something ready to get rid of this creature. And you're not only getting rid of the creature, you're also getting rid of that land drop. So your opponent is getting, uh, is losing a tempo game. You know, boom, there goes your land. All of a sudden, you don't have two lands anymore in a 2 2 creature. You only have one land and it's tapped. And now it's my turn. So in that regard, I think it's a fantastic creature, but you need to really be able to know how to use it when to animate it into an assembly worker because as soon as you make it an assembly worker it's kind of asking to be killed so you really have to think about how you're going to time that but when you can play well with this card and there are many old school players that are playing phenomenally with this card when you can play well with this card it's just a powerhouse it's like it's incredible um to give an example i've recently uh, created a budget blue deck where i play for fourth edition uh, Mishra's Factories, and I don't use it at the start of the game because I'm always tapped out, but especially after sideboarding, my opponent's boarding like a Wrath of God or like uh, an Earthquake, taking care of all my creatures, and then I can always say, oh, but I still have my factories and I can still attack you with, with my factories. So in those cases, the factory has really uh, helped me to just get those last points of damage in. Just, just an example, because there are a lot more 
um, a better decks also the deck we talked uh, earlier about troll disco features four of them almost all the deck itself features four of them almost all the top decks uh, in the format of old school or playing with a play set of Mishra's factories and that alone is enough reason to put it here on number one so thank you for uh, listening to this episode of Timmy Talks the first Timmy's top 10 let me know if you like this um, kind of style of video if you'd like me to do more top 10s or if you just want to see old school magic games now remember every Friday I'm putting a new old school magic game on the channel so that's still there so you can still enjoy that um, let me know what you think of this new style video if you'd like to see more old school magic you can click on the videos that are appearing right now on the screen for now thank you for watching this episode of Timmy's Top 10 and see you next time get us, get us,